Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, to First Fridays with DWG CPA. I'm your host, Daryl Groves, and I'm glad that you're able to join us today. Each month, we seek to provide topics that will be helpful to our clients as they navigate their businesses toward financial and operational success. Our webinars are recorded and posted to our website for viewing later uh, under the Client Center. The format today will be as follows. All participant lines will be muted during the presentation and unmuted during the Q&A session at the end. Questions can be raised during the presentation using the Q&A comment box that should be at the bottom left of your screen. Uh, we'll make every effort to answer your questions during the Q&A session. Um, and uh, as always, you're more than welcome to set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting uh, with any one of us to additional questions or questions that you may have at any time. I think we might need to mute a few lines here because uh, getting a little bit background noise. Uh, we'll do that and, um, and then we'll uh, continue here. So today our agenda is uh, we're going to give you a brief overview of uh, DWG CPA as usual, uh, and then our our guest presenter will be talk will be talking about planning your exit and maximizing your business value, and uh, then we'll have a Q and A session at the end. So um, as you may know, DWG CPA is a full service accounting firm. We provide tax accounting and audit solutions for small businesses, nonprofits, and individuals. Our primary goal is to save you time and money. Uh, and you can feel free to contact any one of us, Joe, Wendy, Simone, Emma, or, or me, if you have, have a question at any time. Uh, for those of you that hadn't yet subscribed to our newsletter, we offer a free, free monthly newsletter uh, that features four to five brief articles each month that are designed to keep you updated uh, year round. And as you can see, the articles uh, this month deal with filing an amended return, tax planning, and planning for your retirement. Um, we also have tax tips uh, on the newsletter. And uh, it, one that's kind of interesting, one of the tax tips that's out there this month for June is uh, what to do if you get a letter from the IRS. Now, it may seem simple, um, but the first, the first thing you do is open it because <laughs> uh, what we found is that a lot of people uh, tend uh, to, to, to not want to open it. And, and so we really uh, think that's the first thing you should do. But, but check out the newsletter and, and um, you know, and see some of the other tips we have around that. Uh, so to subscribe, all you need to do is go to our website at dwgcpatx.com and select subscribe at the top right corner and you'll receive an email asking you to confirm your subscription. That's it. And, um, you know, you can, uh, we really do think the newsletter helps you to stay up to date uh, with the ideas and it may just spark uh, a question or two. Uh, you can also reach us on social media by liking our page on Facebook, following us on Twitter, or connecting uh, via LinkedIn. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's... Okay, so as I mentioned before, our, our guest or our topic today will be on planning uh, for your exit and maximizing your business's value. And uh, our presenters today uh, will be Austin Tanet and Greg DeSimone. And so I'm going to uh, do the introduction of Austin. Uh, many of you may uh, remember that Austin was our fir very first guest presenter uh, as he spoke on the topic of building a robust enterprise in January. Apparently, we liked him so much, we brought him back. <laughs> and uh, Austin is a certified business coach with uh, the focal point coaching organization um, in coaching small and medium-sized businesses, he focuses on the three drivers of profitable, sustainable, and exponential growth, which are strategic direction, customer experience, and team dynamics. Prior to Focal Point, Austin was a successful business development executive with two of the world's largest professional services firm. Uh, good morning, Austin. So Austin, are you there? Can we hear you? I think we can hear you. 
Austin is is on and he's unmuted. Yeah. So Austin may be having trouble with his his mic. I'm gonna move forward here. And so, um, so if Austin, if you're able to uh, come in, I'm sure you'll um, you, you'll you'll chime in when you're when you're able to. But um, our our other presenter today is uh, Greg De Simone, and Greg is a certified business coach with the Focal Point Coaching Organization, as well as the director of their finance center, which provides education and support for the 200 plus coaches in the following areas: exit planning, valuation, benchmarking, projections. Uh, Greg grew his coach, coaching practice with focus on family businesses in areas of exit and succession planning. Due to the growing demand for M&A services from his clients and marketplace, Greg merged his practice with Beacon Equity Advisors to provide a more robust M&A services. Greg is currently their director of Deal Bridge Services, which helps facilitate and close transactions for sellers with the buyers they know. Like, like the knock on the door, the friendly competitor, their management team, and another family member. Prior to Focal Point and Beacon, Greg was a successful financial executive and with venture-backed, private equity-backed uh, public companies. A native of Massachusetts, Greg holds a BS in accounting from Boston College Greg loves a great game of golf, but is rarely, but is rarely great. Yeah, I, I can appreciate that. Uh, he's even heading out uh, to the cave for a round right after the presentation. So we won't hold you up, Greg, and uh, thank you for joining us. So is Greg, Greg, are you able to? Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you now. There you go. <laughs> it's getting worried there. <laughs> no worries. Thank you uh, so much uh, for the introduction and thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, so today I'm going to go really broad on a lot of topics, not very deep, but um, if you have any questions or want to go deeper, I'm sure you can. So, Daryl or Austin would be happy to help you. Um, we're going to quickly work through what walk through what the landscape looks like now for selling your business. Uh, probably one of the most important parts uh, is to find your gap where you are, where you need to be to actually exit. And then we'll just kind of go through some of the components of what you need to know to go through that process and what you need that planning process and implement, more importantly, implementing that plan. Hey, Greg. Um, yes. Now, did you, uh, you can go ahead and take over as presenter. You want okay. to uh, pull those slides. Okay. There you go. One second. All right. So. All right. Yeah. Got it. So that's what we're going to go through uh, today. So um, why don't we kind of go through the landscape. Um, right now, the from this recent survey um, done by a exit planning um, specialty firm up here in New England, uh, only 20 to 33 percent of it, uh, businesses ever get sold. Uh, we also know that from this, their uh, surveys, these owners uh, they surveyed anywhere from 50 to 90 percent of the value of the businesses uh, of their uh, of, excuse me, of their personal net worth is tied up in their business, which really means that if they don't sell their business, their retirement's in jeopardy because all their work net worth is tied up into it. Now another common issue that you might hear is, well, I have a family business, so I'm just going to uh, give it to my kids. Uh, but as you can see from these stats, um, the success of the transfer from one generation to the next is not um, as successful as you might think. Uh, in fact, most companies don't really make it to the second generation. Very, very few of them make it to the third. So take a look at where you are in your generational uh, transition and, and see where how you how you're uh, comparing against that. So what does that mean uh, for all of us, or why does that happen? Um, most of the time, it's because people have never thought about their exit. They think they think about how to start the business. They put a big plan together. They think about where they want to go for vacation. They put a lot of plans in that, but they don't think about how they're going to get out of the business and how to maximize the value. 
another issue, and this is one of my uh, my dad's issue. He, own, he owns a business. Um, he had an unrealistic expectation of value, and he passed up on a really good offer 15 years ago, and that offer is never going to come back again. Um, so uh, those are two things, not having a plan or understanding of how you're going to get yourself out and what it's going to be worth and understanding really what it's worth to get the most value and understand when you're getting a good offer versus when you're getting a frivolous offer. Another consideration um, for a, a business owner is when you're with have a family business, are you trying to leave a legacy? Is the name and legacy important to you? And some people I deal with here at, at, at Beacon um, Equity Advisors, that's really important. Who we sell to to maintain the name is an important aspect of the sale. Um, are you leaving a job for your family? Now, since my dad uh, passed up on his big offer, um, the reason he did that is he didn't think that was enough money to support my younger brother who was in the business. So basically, he kept the business to create a job for life for my for my younger brother. You might, you might need to hit that problem. Okay. And then lastly, uh, you might want to consider, are you just trying to, which, are you better off leaving a job, legacy, or a pile of cash that you can uh, you spend for yourself in retirement or uh, gift through estate planning um, to your family? And those are all questions that you need to talk to your CPA, and you need to talk to your financial advisor, and work together to figure out what are you really trying to accomplish. So the starting point, and this is where I start with all my clients, whether it's uh, going through a transaction or thinking about how to improve the value of their business, and this is where Austin would, would go through, is defining that gap. What is your business really worth now, and what do you need it to be worth to make an exit worthwhile? And again, you need to coordinate with your trusted advisors, your CPAs, your financial advisors, your estate planning attorneys, to really understand that gap. So, so ahead, Greg, um, quick question on that. So um, I, I think many business owners uh, don't necessarily know when is the right time to, uh, to, to get a value on their business where it is. How, how, when do you think is the right time to do that you know, after you know, operating your business and how frequently should it be done or is that going to come later? Uh, no, I, I, not specifically. Uh, since I do valuation work, I think you should do it every year. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, I, I think five to ten years out of, of thinking about a sale, and then you may want to update it every three years or so um, for that per, for the planning purposes. I use the valuation as a benchmark because – all of what you're doing, and I'm going to talk about how evaluate the components of evaluation. All the, the key components of running a good business will flow back into value. And we want to make sure as you get closer and closer to the exit that you, the things you're working on are improving the value. But I would say five, five and ten years out, you start a, that is your benchmark to establish the reality. The other good part about having an evaluation, once you go through it, you can see what's driving the value, and you can pro forma and, so and create a target company. Like, okay, what does the company have to look like to create the value one? Then that creates a roadmap of uh, an, a, that you can create a plan with your coach, with your CPA, uh, with uh, your consultants, say, okay, your management team. How do you close this gap? This we're worth two million today. We need to be worth four. Here's what the business has to look like to, to generate a four million dollar value. Here's the, what's our strategic plan to close that gap. So. Five years, I think it's good. Ten years would probably be a little bit better. Okay, thank you. One of the common questions most people when we talk to uh, ag is that most people we deal with um, with valuation never think, never agree with our valuation. They always think it's too low. Uh, and I actually had a, um, uh, a guy I worked with about eight years ago. His joke was, if you want to know what a business is worth, ask the business owner and then cut it in half. Uh, and that's a joke, but it's a lot of times it's it's pretty close to the truth. There's a lot a lot of times the owners want to get paid for the effort and their hard work, and it's reasonable. But a buyer is not going to pay because of your hard work and effort. They're going to pay for what the business can return to them, which because they're looking at it as an investment. Um, so uh, you have to start to take the look of what is what is the, the buyer's perspective. What do they think? The other thing we get is. 
Public companies are selling it 20 times. So why are you saying that my multiple is three, four, five, or six times um, earnings? And let's just talk about why that might be. One thing is it's, it's apples to oranges um, when you do in the comparison. Uh, a public company, excuse me, my uh, slides aren't advancing. Oh, it's not which. Um... There we go. Let's go for it. There we go. So let's talk about why. What's the difference between the apples and orange um, calculation? A pub company, uh, a PE ratio of of uh, sixteen, let's say, is based on net income, one hundred and forty, uh, four hundred and fifty-five thousand. When you value a private company, we're talking about EBITDA. EBITDA is um, basically adding back taxes, adding back depreciation, adding back interest. It's basically a proxy for cash flow. It's, your, it's basically the, the non-cash expenses in your, in your P&L. So if you take a five on a million dollar company, uh, a million dollar EBITDA private company, and a 16 uh, uh, on a for price earnings ratio on a public company with a million dollars EBITDA, you're going to get relatively close valuation. So that's the first difference between what you might hear in a private company setting versus what you hear with the stock market price earning ratios. The second reason is the difference is public companies have professional management teams. They uh, have training programs. They have, they have people that can step up and take over the business, succession plans. Um, they also have Corporate governance and oversight, because they're reporting publicly, there's a lot more scrutiny than that the numbers are, are, are accurate and real. And lastly, they're liquid and they have access to capital. If you do not like your investment in a public company, you can sell it and get your cash back in two to three days and uh, for very little cost, very, very little transaction fee, and reinvest it in something else. If you're a private company, you've got to go through a whole M&A sales process. Uh, that can take anywhere from nine to 15 months. And I have a slide to kind of show you how that's built up later on. Um, so it's very illiquid and it costs a lot more to go through that transaction. Mm. So that's kind of di the difference is why you can't compare a public and uh, public, actually a public PE ratio to uh, a private company, even dumb multiple that you might hear if you go through a transaction process. Mm. Wow. So the next thing is uh, public, uh, uh, one of the key factors in determining value is growth. Um, a company that's growing is going to generate more value than a company that is steady at the same revenue, same income, year after year after year. Even if you're, you're both at $5 million in revenue and a $1 million in EBITDA at a point in time, the one that went from a $1 million to $2 million to $3 million to $4 million to $5 million is going to be more valuable than the one that's been $5 million for the last five years. Mm. Uh, pop companies historically grow at 7.6% um, each year. We do, we do a study every year. We update that. Um, but they historically have been around 7.6%. A typical um, financial buyer, someone who's just going to make a financial investment, and they're going to base their, their investment based on what the numbers tell them, like private equity firms, they, are, they have a baseline of 10%. They're not even going to. They're going to ignore any company that's below 10%. They start to shrug their shoulders and go, okay, that's nice if they're at 15. They get really interested when the um, company is growing at 25%, but what they're really doing is they're trying to sort through and find the companies that are growing 100%. Uh, and that's where they want to put their money in. And these are the people that have a lot of money to invest in these private companies to help extricate owners from their businesses and help them create an exit plan. In fact, private the one thing to also remember is private equity firms look at lots and lots and lots of business. In fact, we talked to, when we put this slider together originally back on January 17th, we had talked to a PE firm that day who had already reviewed 17 potential targets and opportunities. So so these private equity firms, are, are they're looking at private companies. That, is that uh, the focus there? Right, exactly. So... Uh, and there's, uh, there's, we have a database of about 2,500 private equity firms, and they all have come in different shapes and sizes. They may have revenue targets, like, okay, it's got to at least have 50 million revenue. It's got to have at least 10 million revenue. It's got to at least have 5 million revenue. 
It's got to have um, a management team that's going to stay in place. It's got to have EBITDA of, say, a million bucks, or maybe it's two million, or maybe it's five million. Um, they also may have different targets if they want it to be a platform company versus an add on company. Platform company means, okay, we want to buy a company in, say, the vending machine industry, and that we want to then go and roll up the industry and buy a bunch of other vending machines and create a bigger company. So if you're the platform or the core company, um, the hub, they're going to have a higher standard of revenue and higher standard of EBITDA uh, before they start obtaining that. If they're looking for add-ons, they may lower their, those targets because they're just looking to bolt other companies on to consolidate an industry. Um, so there's a lot of, and it, it, each, each firm has different criteria. Each firm, some people want retail, others won't touch it. Others want technology, others won't touch it. Some people love the old line classic manufacturing distribution and all the dirty um, industrial parks that you see on the side of the highway that you don't know what's going on in there. Others um, want to be in um, in the areas where there's a lot of technology and a lot of uh, activity. Um, so they all have their own investment criteria, uh, but like I said, we, we have 2,500 in our database, and that's no, by no means um, the whole list. Now let's talk about uh, value, uh, just a basic formula. There's two things that create value. One is cash flow. The more cash flow you have, the more your company's worth. And that's with any, and that's a, when you look at any investment, when you're investing in a bond, it's how much interest, how much cash you're going to get out of the bond. When you're looking at a stock in a public marketplace, it's how much of the dividends and how much is the growth expectation, how much cash you actually generate. Um, with this investment over time. The second thing that creates value is risk. So how risky is an investment? Um, what are the things that may make it unattractive? Uh, and the way to grow, grow value is one, obviously is increase cash, or two, reduce the risk. And we're gonna talk about each of those in a little bit more detail uh, in the next few slides. So let's just do a quick example of the impact of cash. And this is pretty straightforward. It's straight, it's straight linear math. If you have a company that's got a million dollars in, in cash flow and it's got a value of five million, that means you have an annual return of 20%. Or uh, that also converts into a 5x multiplier. Cash is a million, value is five, so it's 5x times cash. Well, if you just keep increasing cash, the annual return is going to stay the same and the value just keeps going up. It's a pretty, pretty simple concept. The second concept to, I'm stuck again, I'm sorry. There we go. Um, let's, now let's talk about where cash flow stays constant, but the risk um, improves or decreases, uh, excuse me, increases. So let's talk about a company that's a million dollar cash flow in a $10 million value. That's a 10% return or a 10x, 10 times your cash um, multiple. Um, now, the one thing we have to consider here is that um, you can't sell your company. Most companies can't be sold at a, at a 10x or a 10% return because of the risk involved. Uh, like we said earlier, um, if you uh, private... Uh, Public, private companies are a lot more risky than public companies because of the professional management issues and the liquidity and all that. But let's just take it a little bit further. Um, inflation runs around 3% each year. Treasury bills run around 3.7% each year. Long term, oh, oh, since 1926, long term government bonds have averaged about 5.4% per year. Um, large stocks on the publicly traded stock exchanges have grown since 1926 on average 9.8% per year. And then small stocks on those same exchanges, and small in this context is defined as companies with $350 million or more in revenue. So that's a small company that's, that's um, public, uh, is 11.9%. So now if you can invest your money in any one of those and get your money back relatively quickly. And if you change your mind or if there's better opportunities, you can do that really quickly and get a reasonable return. So if you're going to invest in a, pri a, a private company, you're going to have to offer a much, much better return 
uh, in order to entice someone to invest in a private company versus a public company. Now, a lot of people do, private equity firms particularly, because they'll take on more risk because they can get a better return, and they ask for that better return before they give you the money. So let's look at the impact of the return. Well, if you keep the cash flow constant at a million bucks, but you have to then offer a 20% return on investment to the, the to the um, uh, investor or the buyer, well, you have to basically cut your value to five million. If you want to, uh, if they're asking for a 30% return to get you to get the money, you're going to cut the value to 3.3. And in some cases, and this is not uncommon in uh, growth technology type businesses that have a high rate of failure. You may, um, they may ask for a 40% return, uh, which means you have to cut your value from 10 million all the way down to 2.5 million. So the, the riskiness of the business and the required return of the investor are going to affect the value, even though the cash is the same. Mm-hmm. So that value uh, decrease, uh, you're saying that it, depending on the risk, uh, there, there may be a request for more of a return. Exactly. That's exactly what happens. I said, "Hey, your business is risky, so I'm going to have. I, I need to. I can't accept 20. Uh, my my criteria is going to be 25, or it's going to be 30. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's how they. And then they factor what their cash flow is, and they back into, okay, what can I afford to pay to get the return I want based on the cash this business is going to generate? Gotcha. All right. So the most how do the private, uh, excuse me, public, yeah, private companies get done? Uh, the most common approach is a market multiple, which is kind of like um, if you're selling your house. The real estate agent is going to go out and find a bunch of comparable homes and compare your home to that home and come up with a value. Uh, when it comes to valuing private companies, it's a very similar approach. Um, you can go and, you know, go and find multiple companies in the same industry, the same description, hopefully the same revenue and margin profile and all that. And we'll look at those companies so far. And there's lots of databases out there that track this. We use um, um, Pratt Stats, uh, but there's multiple databases that do this. Um, and then you can compare the, your, your subject company, the company you're valuing or selling, to the comparable companies and figure out what's a reasonable range for, um, uh, for, for market multiple. Um, one thing to remember, there's no real rule of thumb across all industries. Some industries offer higher um, um, multiples than others. Like, uh, small HVAC companies might be in the two to three range, while a larger HVAC company might be up in the three and a half, four, five range. Um, some manufacturing companies are in the, in the three to four or five range, and other, depending on the type of technology in the manufacturing, could be in the five or six, seven range. Um, size matters a lot here. It's not in the slide, but size matters. Uh, but we did a study earlier this year. Uh, companies that have 10 million or more in revenue typically have about 20 to 25 percent uh, higher market multiples than companies in less than 10 million in revenue. Now, uh, I've, now I've noticed through your slides, you're, you're using uh, cash flow as the, I guess, the central um, uh, number that you're using the multiple against. I've heard uh, some use the, the, the revenue. Um, is there, or, um, is it more often very, use cash flow? Most of the time it's either diet. Actually, I'll just put to the next slide here. Um, most commonly, either diet is the um, metric that's used to do multiple, uh, to do the multiples. Okay. Um, but I worked with a, a security um, company. Uh, they monitor the security systems. In that industry, it's basically a factor of 33 to 36 times contract customers under contract and anywhere from 10 to 5 times your monthly um, non-contractual customer revenue. That's pretty standard in that industry. So some industries might have there that makes um, accounting firms have um, similar benchmarks, trade they have versus corporate versus audits versus reviews. Uh, the type of work um, can be bifurcated and bifurcated and separated and you can apply different um, revenue multiples off of that. But for the most part, um, it is EBITDA, although I will say we were working, I'm working with a company right now where it's strategic and we're going to talk about types of buyers in, in a few minutes. Um, 
that the strategic buyer is really buying the customers and the cash flow from that customers. They're going to eliminate most of the G&A when they buy it. So we're, we are, are most uh, doing evaluation in two different ways in trying to see if we can get some um, a confluence of, of factors. One is offered gross margin or gross profit because they're basically buying the customers and their profit. And then we're comparing that to what an EBITDA wants to look like and kind of reconcile that to make sure we're, we're taking a perspective of what the buyers are really looking to get. And again, it's the, what's the, what is the buyer trying to buy is how you determine uh, the value. Most buyers are, are, are willing to pay value based off of cash flow, how much cash they're going to generate. Uh, but there are some circumstances, like you mentioned, uh, like I mentioned earlier, where it could be revenue. In some cases, it could be gross profit. But I would say it's very high, high majorities off of EBITDA. Okay, thanks. And EBITDA for you guys, the definition is up on the screen. It's uh, it's it's uh, all the earnings um, before interest, taxes, depreciation, Again, it's a proxy for your cash-related expenses because depreciation and amortization um, relate to uh, non-cash items. Um, another term you might hear is seller's discretionary earnings. Smaller companies might hear that. Seller's discretionary earnings is EBITDA plus um, plus the owner's income or salary. So it's basically what is the, this particular owner taking out of the business cash-wise each year? So it's the profit and their salary is what they um, is what sell discretionary earnings is. Sometimes there'll be some addbacks for like personal car use and stuff like that. All right. So oh, I went too far. Sorry. So uh, again, I'm going to use private equity firm expectations when we talk about what's a good The reason I'm using private equity firms, they are the classic prototypical financial buyer. They're going to look at your numbers and look at this as an investment. How much how much of a return can they get? And which is more often not the type of buyer you're going to see. Might not be a private equity firm, but it's it's uh, they're they're the, the stereotypical financial buyer. Um, on a $5 million company, they're going to look for a company that has about 10% uh, EBITDA to revenue. That's good or it's okay. Um, what they're really looking for is finding that 20% EBITDA company. And in fact, the company I just mentioned earlier where we were comparing the GP uh, multiple to the EBITDA multiple. Um, one of the things that was pushing their multiple down is their margins in the EBITDA were below industry standards. Um, when we looked at the overall industry and the comparable companies for just our sale data, uh, they were uh, at least 15% behind uh, on margins and on EBITDA as a percentage of revenue. So that how you relate to your industry standards has a big impact on how you're perceived. So these numbers, 10, 20, 10 15, and 20 are, 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 are generic, but within each industry, it's how you compare to your industry competitors is how the PE firm is going to look at it. If they're interested in your industry, they're going to know those benchmarks. They're going to look for companies that are doing better than the benchmarks. Um, we already did that slide. I put it in twice, sorry. So what is risk? Basically, risk is anything that's going to make you unattractive. Um, to other companies. Uh, but I was trained as a coach and focus on being positive. So we want to find out what are the things that will make your business more attractive and more interesting to a buyer that will want them to pay more money. Um, and those are your value drivers. Uh, so if you look at a positive, it's where your value drivers. Um, we have a, a program uh, that I uh, launched with De uh, Austin and some other coaches in Focal Point called Potholes, which is the converse side is what are the things along the road that could put a bump into your car, could maybe dent your rim, or maybe even sink if it's as big as a sinkhole? So how do you either increase the value by focusing the value drivers, or conversely, how do you fill in all the potholes so the smooth road and can increase that value? So you want to focus on how to remove risk, how to increase value and remove those potholes, remove risk. Now, we have a list of about a checklist of about 43 that we go through. But here's a quick high-level list of um, what you need to focus on. This goes across all all industries. Is your industry growing? If it's growing and it's interesting, then you're more likely to attract buyers and get more value. Is your business itself growing? 
the faster you grow, the more attractive you are to someone else, the less risky you seem. And the fact that you, you can say that your business has a potential to grow, but if you can't show it, people may not, the, the buyers may not believe you. You have to demonstrate the growth yourself before someone will pay you for that potential. Your revenue model, if recurring revenues and contractual recurring revenues is better than uh, non-recurring revenue. Uh, you have to look for customer risk. Is, is, do you have too many eggs in one basket? Um, so if you have a customer with more than 10% revenue, you might want to see how you can mitigate that. And obviously, it's not getting rid of that client. It's figuring how do you get more uh, larger clients or uh, more smaller clients that make that um, one customer seem less important. Your financial statements, the quality of financial statements, do you have them all in a, uh, a shoebox? Is it just internal QuickBook financial statements, or do you have a CPA that's compiling them or reviewing them the next level up, or even giving an audit? The, the better the quality of the financial statements, the lower risk of, uh, a buyer will have with your business. Every time you hear a business owner say, I, versus we, uh, that kills value. Uh, it, a business is worth more when it's the team versus the owner. So the owner has to to subject, uh, push down their ego and let the team take over and put play process plus the team can take over, which leads to better systems. Um, you may want to even look at uh, the competition. How hard is it for someone to come in and start up and, and compete with you? If it's easy, your business is less less valuable. If it's hard because of some stickiness you have uh, in the in the industry uh, and with your customers the better. And then intellectual property. If you have any secret sauce that someone else can't copy, uh, makes it more valuable. All right. So now why do we want to focus? So we want to focus on two things, growth, and we want to focus on those risk factors as potholes. And the reason we want to do that is because when you remove the risk, you increase your multiple. And let's look at this example. Baseline company, 5 million revenue, 500,000 EBITDA, 10%. Uh, and this is hypothetical, $4 million in, uh, excuse me, 4X multiple, which means 500,000 times 4 gets you uh, 2 million. But if you can get your company to grow 10 and even up to 20%, that's going to help increase your, your multiple. If you also address other risk factors or value drivers, um, you can move your multiple from, say, a 4 to 4.5 four from 5, and that's not uncommon to be able to move a multiple um, 1x, 1.5x um, uh, within an industry, if you're, particularly if you're at the lower end or at the, at the, bottom, the middle or bottom, lower end of the, uh, of the range of multiples for your industry. So a company that was at $5 million at 4x is $2 million, over a few years grows at 20%, improves the risk factors and gets to a five multiple. Now it becomes a eight, uh, 800,000 EBITDA company of the five multiples, $4 million, you, double, you can double your your income versus if you didn't work work on any um, any uh, risk factors and you stayed at a four multiple, the eight hundred thousand times four is only three point two. You generated an extra eight hundred thousand dollars of value in this example by not just focusing on growth and cash flow, but focusing on reducing the risk to improve your multiple. Um, now there's Three different types of buyers. I'm going to quickly go through this. Knowing the types of buyers that are out there and what they're attracted to can help you with your plan of what you want to focus on so you attract the right buyer who's willing to pay the most amount of money for you or uh, give you the right terms. And we'll talk about the difference between terms of money in a minute. So a strategic buyer. These buyers will typically pay the most. They could be a competitor or someone who wants to come into an industry. Uh, and so rather than try to start from scratch, they'll buy the industry expertise. Or they, you may have your company may have a service that they want to add that's complementary to their business. Or, for example, the company that I, again going back to the same company uh, I was talking about earlier, um, it's a lighting theatrical production company. They get they're being looked at a national company who doesn't have a presence in New England, and they have uh, they want to get into New England, and the relationships are, uh, you need to have a presence in New England to, to create those relationships because it's very uh, parochial up here. Or you may have synergistic products. Like there's a company that dealt with down on Cape Cod um, that does uh, fire extinguisher testing, fire extinguisher testing, and uh, replacement. Um, they're uh, looking to be acquired by a company who does the fire alarms. So this company with the fire extinguisher um, testing company has 8,000 customers that this fire alarm company can't get into. So if they can buy this 
fire extinguisher company, they can add on a service and get access to 8,000 customers that they can then upsell alarms. So that's that's what strategic buyers are looking to do. Um, and they tend to pay more. Um, but they'll tend to um, also put a, an earn out on it to make sure that they're getting the value that they're buying. So you may get less cash up front. You may not get 100% cash. You may get 70 or 80% of the cash upon closing and then the rest of it through an earn out where when you hit certain performance milestones, you get paid uh, more. And in, case, in some cases, you can position it to have upside on those earn outs. A financial buyer, that's kind of what we talked about earlier, is the, the, a typical one or a prototypical one is a, um, is a uh, PE firm, private equity firm. So they're looking for growth, opportunity, financial return. Um, they're looking for companies that are doing well but not doing as good as they could because they know that they can, if they put some resources into it, they can get more out of it. They may not pay the business owner for that, but that's what they're looking for, upside opportunity. And they're looking for management depth so that – because. Private equity firms aren't coming in to uh, run the company. They're coming in to invest, and they want to make sure if the owner's stepping up, that there's people left behind that can run the business and help them improve the value of that investment. Financial buyers typically will pay more in cash up front. So these are the type of buyers. You may get less money than a strategic buyer, but you'll get more cash at closing. So these are things you need to consider going to your plan. Do we want the most amount of money, and I don't care how long it takes for me to get it, or do I want the most amount of cash the day I sign the papers and hand the keys over to the business. And then the third type of buyers are buyers. It's typically an individual, or sometimes my human calls them entrepreneurial buyer. And they're basically looking to buy our income. Um, uh, so this is, uh, these people typically pay less than everybody else because they have to be able to finance it and still have to pay themselves a salary uh, to run the business. And oftentimes they will pay, um, they won't give you a problem on the contract. They may not even do full financing from the bank to cover the transaction. So they may ask, and it may be required by the seller to do some financing. We call it seller financing or seller paper and take a personal note that the, uh, the buyer pays the seller over five or six years um, uh, uh, no, uh, loan payments. So what we want to do is when you're working with your CPA, your coach, your manager team, figure out how do you match yourself up with the strategic buyers? How do you match yourself up with the good financial buyers so that you can maximize the value? Obviously, you want to maximize your cash flow because the more cash your business generates, the more likely it's going to be worth more because the more cash, the better the value. And lastly, reduce the risk. Uh, identify what your value drivers are, what your potholes are, and fill them in. So we said we have a... We have 43 pothole checklist program at Focal Point and Beacon Equity Advisors. Um, what you do is you can, what we do is assess every one of those potholes and then we prioritize which ones are going to have the biggest impact and which ones do we have the resources to improve over the time frame that the owner is looking to exit. Because you may not have the time or the resources to fix them all, so you want to prioritize which ones will have the biggest impact of value and spend your time focusing on that uh, because you still have to run your business. Um, if you focus just on um, on dressing it up for sale, you may lose the core value of just running a good business. Um, we talked about these, so I don't want to do it again. So the other thing too is selling your business is a team sport. Uh, it's usually not just one person. Uh, you need to have a good CPA. You need to have an attorney. Uh, and there's two types of attorneys you're probably going to need. You probably need a state of planning attorney as you lead up to the plan, and then a good corporate transactional attorney as you go through the transaction. An M&A advisor or sometimes, a, depending on the size of business, you might get a business broker to help you list and sell the business. Uh, a wealth advisor to help make sure that the proceeds are going to be spent correctly. Do you have um, funding for buy-sell agreements and all that kind of stuff? Uh, and then lastly, a coach or an exit plan that will help you pull all the pieces together and maximize the value uh, and the op and revenue growth and the operations um, between now and when you want to sell it. A thing also to consider is you may have a great um, transaction, uh, a great attorney, or you may have a great CPA, uh, but if they don't know, uh, if they haven't done the type of Transactions, like for example, a um, 
you may have a great real estate attorney. Um, it's closed your last three houses, may even help you on a commercial property, but they've never sold a business. Well, that's not the, they may be great at what they do, but they're not the right person for this transaction. Doesn't mean they're not a good attorney, it just means they're not the right person for, the, for what you need done. And you want to make sure you have the right team because the buyers usually do this many times. This isn't the first time you're looking to buy a company. It may be your only time to sell your business, but it definitely won't be the buyer's only time. So you want to make sure you have the right team advising you through this process. And the earlier you can get your team in place, the better. When do you start? Now, I would start with defining what your, is your business really worth. Sorry, I'm too fast there. Because that's your starting point. And compare it to what you need it to be worth. What do you need to, to fill that hole in your retirement and your future plans? And that's where you need to have that team in place. Your, your, your uh, estate planning attorney, your financial advisor, your CPA, all of them need to participate in that conversation with you. Once you understand what that gap is, put a plan to close that gap, and it's where a business coach can come in and to play and help you with that. Uh, and then the next two things is focus, definitely focus on growth. Um, because growing companies are worth more than stable companies and way more than companies that are, are declining. And then identify what are the risk factors and the value drivers within your business. Prioritize which ones will have the biggest impact on a sale, which one are going to be more attractive, uh, are going to do the, uh, the fixing of certain ones will be more attractive to a potential buyer, particularly the type of buyer you want, and um, put a plan in place to systematically improve those. Um, let's skip that one. One of the things um, you want to also think is, this is what my dad missed out on. He wasn't ready to sell. He got a great offer, but he wasn't ready to sell. But putting a plan in place doesn't mean you have to sell at any point in time. It just means that your business is ready to be transferred any time, that when you get an offer, you can properly evaluate it. Is it a fair offer? Is it an unbelievably great offer? Or is it a poor offer? If, if, you, if you're in a position where your business is ready to transfer at any point in time and you understand the value, you can easily make decisions on these and, and do it in confidence, knowing that you're not missing the boat on the opportunity of a lifetime. Um, Austin, do we have enough time? I don't want to go too far. I can talk about the difference of the asset sale versus the stock sale and some other stuff. Yeah, I think what... I mean, Daryl. <laughs> Austin or Daryl. Yeah. Can, you, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Technical difficulties behind me. Yeah, why don't we just maybe, I think you've covered the book, but why don't we just kind of open it up to, to questions. Uh, I did have one for you, Greg, if you've got. Sure. Uh, so um, I know we talked about the different types of buyers. If the seller was interested in, in selling the business to either a family member mm -hmm. and or the existing employ, employer, employee or employee group, what are some of the unique challenges that you see in those types of transactions? Uh, well, there's, for family, it's um, is the family member um, that you're going to give that you're going to gift it and put the state transfer type process in place with your family, and you can only do that if you have built up enough um, savings through the prior cash flow of the business. Or do you need your family member to buy the business and create a transaction to fill that gap? Uh, and one of the things that we have found here is that um, parents many times inadvertently, um, excuse my language, they, they screw their kids over. They sell the business for too much. There's no way that the kid can, even if they run it well, can support the debt that they have to take on to pay to, to buy the business because there's no there was, since there was no outsider helping them figure out what value was and what the transaction was the parents asked the kids what the ego price is so remember I joked around about ask the business owner what it's worth and, uh, and then cut it in half well when you don't have an outsider looking at it the parents say I think it's worth this the kids go oh, okay that makes sense they pay 50 percent 100 percent more than they should and then they get crushed under debt and the business goes under so that's one thing you have to be careful is making sure that you you transfer the right value. And then two is if they transfer the right term, even if it's if you want to maximize value, what are the different mechanisms you can do to maximize it? And it doesn't have to be a straight sale. You could work with your financial advisor and your state planning attorney and put in different um, uh, 
funding mechanisms through buy sell agreements and through life insurance policies. And there's all kinds of ways to do that. It doesn't have to be straight sales. So that's why you really need to have a team in place to figure out what's the right the right mix of what are you trying to accomplish with your estate and with your um, kids and with your own retirement. Um, but if it's a, a straight sale to the kids, to the kids, it's making sure that you have a get a fair value. It's something that they can actually manage. And after that, make sure the kids actually are competent to, to take it over. Uh, just because they have the same name does not mean they're competent to run the business. They they have a different background and different mindset than the parents, even though they grew up in the same house. That's great. Yeah, I, I definitely think this is um, a, a really uh, valuable topic um, for our clients, and uh, to, you know, forgive the pun, uh, but um, uh, you know, because uh, one of the things I notice is that we we never get to that type of question. I think many business owners don't really think about that exit strategy until they're ready to do it. Mm -hmm. and so uh, one thing I, I, I like what you said there is that um, they need to be planning well ahead of uh, when they're going to actually pull the, you know, pull the trigger um, and, and exit. Um, so um, if they were trying to get a, a value, that initial value, who would you who would you contact or how would you go about doing that? To do to just do just, evaluation of the business? Yes. What's the best source for that? I would say me, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but there's all kinds of um, valuation experts out there. Um, but it also valuations are, aren't one that fits all. Um, when we do valuations here at Beacon Equity Advice, are ultimately when people engage with us, it's ultimately to sell the business. So when we do evaluations perspective, what will the buyer actually pay? Which seems logical. But um, if you're doing a state transfer, a stock transfer, and a state transfer, or state planning, um, you may value it slightly differently because the goal is then to minimize the value so uh, that you pay less taxes through the transfer. Um, it's there's still valid techniques. Uh, to do that, it may come up with a completely different value than, say, I would to say, here's what a, a an uninterested or un, uh, unrelated third party would pay for it. Um, and I, I might say the business is worth three, uh, three million, and uh, another valuation expert who's doing it for state transfer purposes might say it's only worth two million. And we both can be right because we're using different techniques, different processes, and we have a different purpose for valuation. So that's you've got to be careful. What is the purpose? Of the um, of the uh, valuations of the state tra planning uh, transfer is it for an ESOP fund an ESOP um, again that's usually tax implications or is it I want to know what's worth so if I go to market and I want to evaluate a fair offer um, that uh, that's what I'm, I'm getting and make you have to be yet when you when you do the valuation you have to ask for that and make sure that they know that's what you're you want them to do when we work with engaged clients we tell them exactly that's this is how we're approaching it. Um, uh, is that what is an uh, unrelated third party? What would they be willing to pay? The, what, not the premium value they're paying. What is a reasonable value? That's where some people, some business owners get their feelings hurt. Um, where they say, I think it could be worth five million. You're like, well, it's really, I think, three and a half. Like, if you get five, then it's like, that's great. You now know that's a great offer. Uh, and you might get five, but realistically, your realistic value. Baseline is like is say three million to three eight four million, and that's what you want to do. What realistically can I get so you can realistically evaluate offers that get presented to you? All right. So um, at this section uh, of the of our uh, meeting, what we want to do is uh, just kind of open up uh, our uh, attendee lines. If anyone has any questions. Uh, that they want to ask either Austin or Greg. Do that. Give a few minutes for that. And it doesn't look like we have any questions now, but um, but definitely uh, we want to thank you, Greg, for your uh, presentation, and thanks, Austin, for 
um, you know, for um, making the introduction uh, to Greg. We really appreciate we appreciate that. We appreciate both of you for um, for this for this uh, topic. And um, and so um, also, I want to uh, uh, thank all of our uh, attendees for your attention and, and presence. Uh, next month, uh, what we uh, what we want to cover is the topic of um, how critical marketing is to the long term financial sex success of your business. And so we hope we join us uh, next month. And um, if you have any questions afterwards, feel free to reach out to us and uh, have a great weekend. Thanks. Right. Thanks, Daryl.